what we're discussing is our calling as disciples to duplicate. It's so intriguing and interesting how Jesus put it in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. He said, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. We see in Matthew 28, 18, a divine directive. Everybody say divine directive. Jesus came and not asked, but told his disciples. The divine directive means that we as leaders, and I want you to know that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a leader. If you, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, as we often say, we are so glad that you are here. But if you have made the decision to follow Christ, that decision in turn has made you a leader. And with that comes no choice but to make disciples. We have a divine directive, but not only do we have a divine directive, we also see with that divine directive, we have been commanded to duplicate and make other disciples. He, he says, go ye therefore and make disciples. Where? All nations. Everybody say all nations. Let's look at Acts 1, 6 through 8 because it gives us more context. It says, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Their, their interest was to be restored as a nation. Their interest was to release themselves from the dominion of Rome. Their, their interest was ultimately in the wrong thing because Jesus replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. So it's, it's not my business. And then he goes on to say, and they are not for you to know, and it's not your business either. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. Our ability to lead and witness to others is evidence that we have the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting that the evidence of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit shows up in our leadership? We don't think about this often in the church. We think the evidence of the Holy Spirit is running around the church. We think the evidence of the Holy Spirit is, is speaking in other tongues, and it may be some of those things, but that's not the only thing. The evidence of the Holy Spirit per Jesus is your ability to lead others to him, your ability to impact, your ability to influence. He says, you are going to get the Holy Spirit, and the evidence of that is going to be you telling people about me. Everywhere, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He says Jerusalem intentionally because that's where they were. That's where they were from. Jerusalem is your neighborhood. He says, I want you to start where you're comfortable. Let's make this realistic. Will you start telling people about me in your neighborhood? Would you bring your neighbor to Quest? They even let you bring coffee into the worship center. You love it. Would you, would you start by letting somebody on your basketball, baseball, football, gymnastics team know that you follow me? Will you start in your Jerusalem? 
But then don't get comfortable in your Jerusalem because God's all about pushing us out our comfort zone. So when you go from Jerusalem to Judea, Judea was the larger city in of which Jerusalem was in. So Judea could, in a contemporary context, be considered our CSRA. So when you go from Jerusalem to Judea, Will you spread my message outside of Grovetown? Will, will you take your city in my name? I want you to go from Jerusalem. I want you to go from Judea. And here's the best part to me. I want you to go to Samaria. I'm, I'm, I'm glad he added this part because Samar Samaritans and Jews despised one another, saying it lightly. Samar Samaritans were descendants of Jews who intermarried with foreigners and didn't fo follow fully the Jewish religion and culture. So the, the Jews did not like the Samaritans because the Samaritans weren't fully Jews because they intermarried with foreigners. Let me make it clear, it wasn't that God didn't want the Jews to marry people who were not like them in, in, in skin tone. It, it, it was because the, he didn't want the Jews to marry anybody who didn't worship who they worshiped. So he said, don't intermarry with foreigners because once you marry them, they're going to begin to lead you towards their God and you were created to lead them towards yours. So the Samaritans were Jews who, who intermarried with other religions and began to worship other gods. So here's what Jesus was saying that I hope we get. Start in Jerusalem, but don't stay there. Go to Judea, but don't stay there. The true evidence of your leadership and my power working through you is your ability to go to Samaria. Can you minister to somebody you don't like? If you're a Democrat, can you witness to a Republican? <laughs> if you're a Republican, would you be willing to share the message of Christ with a Democrat? If you're rich, will you go to a neighborhood where they have to catch the bus? If, if, if you believe in me, the evidence of that is your willingness to spread the message to somebody who may not be like you. I want you to take my message to the world. The world won't be like you. The world won't live like you. The world won't dress like you. The world won't talk like you. The world won't believe everything that you believe, but don't major on the minors. Can you get them to believe in me and let me work out the rest? He says, leadership is your ability to impact and influence the world in my name. And then he says, I've given, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, anytime you see therefore, you have to see what it's there for. The therefore is point in verse 19 is pointing us to verse 18. I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, or because of that, you go. Because I know you're going to make excuses. You're going to talk about you're not a good leader. You're going to talk about you're not eloquent in speech. You're going to talk about you don't know enough to go make disciples. And he says, I have been given all authority. And if you are, if I am in you through your faith, you have authority. So don't make excuses. Go. It's not going to be about your power. It's going to be about mine. Go. It's not going to be about what you know or don't know, but because the Bible teaches us that when we show up, the Holy Spirit will give us words to say, so just go. All authority means without 
excuse. He, he says, go make disciples. That's the divine directive. That means we're without choice. He says, I want you to minister and, and lead the Jews in Jerusalem, those who are in Judea, and I want you to go to Samaria in the uttermost parts of the earth. That means I want you to duplicate disciples without discrimination. And you've been given all authority, which means you're without excuse. Genesis 12, 2 says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I thought y'all get more excited about that. I will make you a great nation. He's speaking to Abraham. And, and, and we are grafted into that promise through faith. So he's saying, he's saying to us, I will make you great. And I will bless you. It's good for Christians to understand that because th sometimes as Christians, we, we, we think that we shouldn't be blessed. Or that we shouldn't be great. Or that we shouldn't be famous. The, the sin isn't in the greatness. The sin is what, who the greatness is for. God will make you great if you know it's not about you. God will make you famous if you know that it's not because of you. God will give you power if you're willing to be a conduit. He, he says, I'm going to, to, to give you my power, but my power is not for you to become powerful in and of itself. My power is for you to be a conduit. I want my power to go to others through you. Go and make disciples. He says, teach others to obey what I've taught you. Teach what you have been taught. That assumes as disciples, as leaders, we ought to be learning. So he says, as you learn, teach. As you've been blessed, bless. As you've been given power, give power. You are given power to give power. We are giving blessings as leaders to give blessings to other leaders. We have been taught not so we can be puffed up in knowledge, not so we can act holier than thou. We've been taught so we can teach others. We see a great example of this in 1 Kings chapter 19. It, it says, starting in verse 15, then the Lord told him, speaking to Elijah, Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Mehalah, to replace you as my prophet. Find your replacement. He says, Elijah, it's not just about you. Elijah, I gave you power so you could give somebody else power. Elijah, don't be stuck up and self-centered. 
Don't think that I can't get my work done through anyone else. Don't, don't think it's only about you. I want you to set up a succession plan. Find your replacement. I told at 9 a.m. that the, one of the most discouraging things is when you go to a church and it's almost like they have to wheel the pastor out there in a wheelchair and he's 90 years old and you're like, why haven't you found your replacement? You think the church can't go on without you? And if that's true, you fail to lead. Jesus has commanded us to find our replacements. Hey, parents, li listen to this. You want to know why the Bible says that our children are arrows in a quiver? When the warriors would go out to fight, they would hold arrows in, in what, what was called a quiver in, in a contemporary context, a backpack with an opening at the top. And those warriors would pull out the arrows and they would shoot those arrows towards the enemy. Our children are arrows in our quiver. And so if you believe in Christ, Who's going to continue to spread the message of Christ in your family once you're gone? Find your replacement. Your child doesn't belong to you. They belong to God. That's why I love Quest so much, because they're a ministry that leans towards the next generation, because they understand that as leaders and parents, we ought to be preparing our children to take our place. How can the message of the kingdom continue if we're not preparing our young people to take our place? He says, Elijah, Elijah, go anoint Elijah. Who's going to replace you? <laughs> That's so good to me. You know God's trying to replace you. You want to know why? Because it's not about us. It's about him. And we get to participate for a particular time, but eventually we got to get out the way. Parents, leaders, find your replacement. And what was interesting is Elijah finds Elisha plowing. Why is that interesting? Because Elijah was a what? Prophet. Oh, <laughs> let me try this. Dan, Dan, let me holler at you real quick. Here it is. Elijah was a prophet, and God tells him, find your replacement. And he sends him to Elisha, who's in the field, plowing. <laughs> John, do you know your replacement may not even be here at Quest? <laughs> do, do you know your replacement may, may not be who you think they are? That's why he says, I want you to go to the uttermost parts of the earth because your replacement may not be like you. Your replacement may not look like you. Your replacement may not feel like you. He found his replacement for the office of prophet somewhere plowing. That's why we have to be led by the Holy Spirit as we lead others. That's why I hope as a CEO, you're not just hiring someone off a disc assessment, but you're praying about that. I hope as a, a, a leader, you're not just picking people to, to serve with you, that you're praying about that. Because in your flesh, you won't pick right. He gets a directive from God to go find his replacement and he didn't get sent to the school of prophets. He found him in the world. I truly believe that as Christians, we ought to find a way to be in the world. I truly believe that as believers, we ought to find a way to integrate ourselves with the community. 
As, as believers and, and leaders, I really hope that we get more Christian lawyers and Christian doctors and Christian politicians. I really hope that as, as believers, we can infiltrate the school system and infiltrate the government and, and infiltrate the financial sector. Why? Because God wants control of it all. He sent him to the world. Because we are told to teach what we've been taught. Elijah, you know how to do miracles. Show someone else how to do that. Elijah, you know how to pray. T teach this plower how to pray. Elijah, you know how to lead my people in developing their relationship with me. Find your replacement. Teach what you've been taught. And if you go to 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, that, that, this is the end of Elijah and Elisha's mentoring relationship. If you, if you read through, through 1 Kings 19 and, and 2 Kings, you, you'll see how, what the, the work that Elijah and Elisha did together. And it ends in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. It says, when they came to the other side, Elijah said, to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replied, I love this. Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. I love that. Those of us that know how to follow should not be ashamed to tell those who are leading us, I want more than you. See, you would call that arrogance and pride. I, I call it righteous ambition. He says, when, when I die, Elijah, I want to have accomplished twice as much as you. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Elijah, when I'm done, I want there, there to be a debate on who was the best prophet. I wasn't following you for no reason. I want to inherit a double portion of what you have. Young people, you ought to tell your parents that. Mom, Dad, when I leave, I want to have twice as much in the bank as you have when you do. My, mom and dad, when, when it's my time to go, I want to have led twice as many people to Christ as you did. I want double what you have. I love Elijah's response. This is, this is why he was a tremendous leader. He says, you've asked a difficult thing. <laughs> it's not easy being me. <laughs> But if you see me when I'm taken away from you, you'll get your request. I'm going to tell you what you got to do to get it. And you, you will see if you follow Elisha's ministry that he accomplished twice as many miracles as Elijah did. Elisha was confident enough in his leadership not to be offended that the person he was leading wanted to be greater than he was. That's the key to leadership. If we are leaders, then we ought to elevate and delegate. We, we ought to set those up who serve with us for success. I love how Jesus put this. He said, I have power. I'm going to share my power with you. Now go. That's the key to leadership. Leadership is about empowering others to disconnect ourselves, d disconnect themselves from us so they can go do what they're called to do. The true test of leadership are, is are we able to empower others to get the job done without them being attached to us? You are not a leader if every time somebody has something to do, they have to come to you to get permission. Jesus says, go, leave, get out my face. 
I'm about to ascend. I, I've done my job. It's time for you to do yours. Elijah says, I'm going to give you what you need to accomplish double what I've accomplished. Shame on us if those who we lead can't do more than we did. Shame on us if our children can't do more than us than we did. Shame on us if we don't leave our community in a better place after we go than it was when we were with it. Shame on us if we can't help level up those we lead. Because a real leader knows I get the part of your credit. That when people talk about you, whether they know it or not, they're talking about me. A real leader knows that by empowering others, their legacy continues. You ought to read this book if you haven't. It's great. It's called Good to Great by Jim Collins, one of my favorite books. He gives, he gives levels of leadership. A level four leader is when an organization thrives when the leader is in place. When an organization grows when a, when a leader is in place. That's level four. That's good leadership. But level five is when an organization grows after the leader leaves. He said a level five leader is a leader that sets up systems. A level five leader is a leader that teaches what they have been taught so that the place continues to thrive even when the leader's gone. We have to leave those we lead with the ability to hit the next level. Our children ought to be holier than we are. Our children ought to have better marriages than we had. Our churches ought to go further once we're gone. Why? Because we're teaching what we've been taught. How can we say that we are teaching what we've been taught if we look at our circle and we're the only ones doing well? You want to know if I'm a leader? Look at my son. Look at my genealogy. You want to know if you're a leader? Look at your family. Do they look like you? Or are you the only one thriving? The, the true test of leadership is not your personal success. The true test of leadership is if you can look around me and everybody in my circle's doing good. Everybody in my circle is following Christ. Everybody in my circle is leading and making disciples. You should be able to look around you and see that other people's lives are being impacted because of your purpose. Leadership is understanding that We are without choice because we've been given a divine directive. Leadership is duplicating disciples without discrimination. Real leadership is understanding you have all authority, which means you are without excuse. Real leadership is helping those around us level up their leadership so that when we're gone, they can accomplish twice as much. Your homework is to look at those who are in your circle. Those you lead in your ministry, those you lead in your home, those who are closest to you. Ask yourself, what would happen if we were gone? Ask yourself, am I a level four leader or a little level five? Would my organization thrive when I'm gone? Is my family set up to thrive if I'm gone? 
dads, let me holler at you real quick. Would your wife know how to lead your family if you were gone? Would she know how to handle the money? My wife handles the money now, so she's good. <laughs> I told my wife, if, I, if she dies, I don't know how to pay the bills. Our life's going to get cut off and we're going to have the money. Do your children know how you make the decisions that you make? Do they know the scriptures that they need to go to when they get in a tough spot? Do they know that, 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 that daddy or, or mommy isn't doing this on their own? That the lights are on not because dad pulled himself by, up by his own bootstraps or not because mom is so smart, but because God is so good? Real leadership is when we can duplicate. Is when we can make others more like Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us all authority. And we want to pray that you will help us to use it to make others like you. will you help us to duplicate disciples without discrimination will you help us to take the message to people who may not look like us live like us vote like us will you help us to obey your command to try to find creative ways to minister in our neighborhoods, to get the word out about what God is doing through our church and through our ministries and through us as individuals. God, will, will you make your power ma made manifest in our lives in new, miraculous, and magnificent ways? God, will you help us to increase our impact on this city and in this country and in this world for your name's sake, for your glory and our good? God, will you help us to step out of our comfort zone? God, if there's anything that is in us that is keeping us from impacting our family like you've called us to, from leading our community and companies like you've called us to, from growing our church like you've called us to, God, will you convict us and change us right now in the name of Jesus? God, we're not here for fun, not here for form or fashion, God. We're here to find more out about you and how we can use your spirit to make a significant impact in our society. God, will you help us to do that? Hallelujah. Will you manifest your wisdom, your discernment, your grace upon us in this moment? filling us with your spirit understanding that the evidence of that is our motivation to be a witness maximize that motivation in the name of Jesus we pray